wow, you guys must be over your hangovers. <laughs> the last crew was really quiet, so this, this is a good sign. Um, so I'm here today to talk about rapeseed production in the mid-Atlantic. Um, this is relatively new for a lot of our states as far as um, interest level goes. You know, we used to grow it maybe 15, 20 years ago for a short stretch and then interest away. Now we're back to, to interest again. Um, you're going to hear me say rapeseed, you're going to hear me say industrial rapeseed, you're going to hear me say canola. They're all the same plant. We grow them for different purposes. Um, it's really hard for me to get canola out of my lingo because I spent uh, three years working in the wheat canola rotation um, at Oklahoma State University um, out there, and they grow all canola for human consumption oils and animal feeds versus here, where we grow a little bit more of the industrial rapeseed um, that's used for industrial lubricants and plastics. Um, and plastic coatings. So um, still same plant, same production practices, so don't be discouraged if you see the word canola or if we talk about canola a little bit in the talk. So we'll start with the U.S. Canola um, kind of projected goals. U U.S. Canola Association had some projected goals back in 2013 um, where they expected canola acres to go. You can see the Northern Plains, which is our biggest production region in the U.S., kind of goes up and down. Basically what it is and whether they can get the, all their um, they fly a lot of the Atlantic which is the purple line down here so that's us not a lot of, of increases um, and not a lot of projected increase over time we sit somewhere around a 30 to 50,000 acres um, depending on how interested and how pushy the the contractors are in in a given year uh, so that is basically where we we sit for the whole entire region um, not just for a single state um, I'm pretty informal, so if you have questions as we go through, feel free to ask them. Um, and if you don't ask them, you might not get to because we didn't even make it to the end of the presentation last time uh, for, for there to be time for questions, so keep that in mind. Why grow rapeseed in the Mid-Atlantic? Diversification. In the Mid-Atlantic region, we can grow lots of crops. We can grow crops all year round, so we usually don't have a problem with the diversification part. In Oklahoma, that was much more important because it was wheat after wheat after wheat, so the canola was a good diversification tool. Obviously, when, uh, for winter crops, we are mostly growing wheat if we're going to cover the ground in the winter. Um, some folks will grow some other small grain, but it's still a grass crop. And so we end up with a suite of grass weeds in the wintertime, and adding a broadleaf crop can help us to clean that up. Um, in our region, we are starting to see more and more resistant grasses. So this tool um, can go away very quickly if we don't manage it appropriately. Um, ALS resistance, we can manage. ACC ACE resistant grasses, we still cannot manage in this system. And then a winter crop, or maybe most importantly, a winter crop that is not um, tied to the traditional grain market. So it is an oil seed, a starchy grain, so it is not tied to the corn market, it's not tied to the wheat market, and price um, as such can be better than wheat in most years if you can get a good yield. Um, good yields in our region um, should be somewhere between 50 and 70 bushels, depending on your soil type and how well you manage. I tell a grower, if you can hit the 50 bushel mark, you know, you can capitalize on growing this crop um, and do at or better, which you would be doing with wheat in that same year. Um, so those, those are the targets that I go for. A little bit more on the number side before we kind of jump into the meat of, of what we do for growing this. Um, this was put together by the North Carolina Biotechnology Center. It's basically the um, states, most of the states in our region, I think we're lacking Tennessee and Kentucky here. Um, but basically it's an average of three years of winter wheat acres divided out for the average per year and then showing the potential um, rapeseed or canola acres, depending on what state you're in, um, if you were looking at a winter rotation, okay? So there's, there's quite a number of acres. I think the, probably the North Carolina and the Georgia numbers a little bit inflated because 2013 wheat acres were astronomically high uh, for our states um, because wheat price was, was up that year. So the North Carolina and the Georgia numbers are probably a little steep, but other than that, we're pretty, um, pretty on target with what we could be growing. Only growing it once in three years, why? Any, any thoughts on why? I heard insects, I heard disease. The number one would be disease. So sclerotinia is our biggest um, in this crop. And so in our region where we're moist in that part of the, the year um, where we can get infection, 
we're going to see issues with sclerotinia and we don't want to be growing that year after year after year and building the sclerotinia problem. Uh, just a little bit of, I don't have a ton of pictures of these in crops, so I just wanted to give you a little cartoon for, for what this looks like if you haven't ever dealt with um, rapeseed or, or um, canola before. So the seedling comes up, you know, you've got your kind of early leaves and then by the time you hit fall and that first freeze, you should have a rosette like many of your weeds would look like, right? You've got a rosette that's kind of sucked down close to the ground. And then flowering would be occurring um, sometime in mid-April for most of us, maybe a little later. Forward. And then um, at maturity, we're going to have a, a plant, hopefully, that is five to six feet tall, seed pods on it. So that's what we're looking at. Seen really good yields. I harvested a field last year that was one of nice, long, full um, seed pods for um, your yield potential. So crop rotation is the first subject I'm going to cover. We're going to cover this basically from the previous crop all the way um, through. The, we made it through weed management. We didn't quite make it to um, marketing and storage in the last, and I suspect we'll be in the same boat this time. So considerations are important. Only growing it once in three years. This is typically a crop insurance, insurance for canola or rapeseed in your counties. Um, they're going to have that requirement. Last year, our risk management association asked me um, if we could decrease that to two years, and I said, absolutely not. This is a poor choice. Um, it would be a, a poor risk on your part um, to take that risk and, and grow it more than once in three years. And then you want to carefully consider your herbicide choices if rapeseed or canola are going to be in your crop lineup. If you're not going to plant corn this year, and go through your herbicide program in corn and then decide in August that you're going to plant rapeseed this fall. Why not? Herbicides, right? There, there's a lot of um, sensitivity and long sensitivity to even herbicides that aren't necessarily long residual in some cases. Um, following soybean and peanut can also be a little more risky if you have any history of clarity on your farm. So keep that, that in mind. Um, you're better off to follow um, corn or sorghum if you've been, tractor doesn't show up until, you know, summertime to um, increase his acres. So it's really important to start thinking about that well ahead of planting. So I've got herbicide rotation restrictions. There's a couple of slides on this. This one is from wheat to rapeseed. And I know that maybe doesn't make a lot of sense for you. Oklahoma is just canola and wheat. We don't have any summer crops except for in the panhandle. And even the herbicide you use in your previous wheat crop can impact your rapeseed because we have looked 12 month rotation restriction, 10 month, 18 to 22 month plus rainfall requirement. So especially those group two herbicides, which we use quite a number of in wheat, um, they can have a long rotation restriction depending on the rate to rapeseed or canola. Now, if you're talking about canola, you can sometimes get around it because there are differences in susceptibility to this restriction. And so you'll, you can find some information out there in the literature that says these varieties are less susceptible to um, group two herbicide residues. Okay, we don't have that information for industrial rapeseed um, because we don't have a national breeding program here in the U.S. that's testing any of that. So this just gives you this, and this is in months, by the way. Um, it doesn't have it there, but it's in months. So if you need pictures of any of these slides, um, go for it. I'm, I'm not claiming proprietariness on any of this. You can find this in the label, though it can be convoluted to look for. Then we have one from corn um, or grain sorghum over to rapeseed, and I've included wheat here because you would often use either wheat or rapeseed as that wintertime crop. Um, so you can see the differences. If you're using dual or cinch, cinch ATZ, those products, um, well, cinch alone, four and a half months for wheat, but 12 months for rapeseed. Okay, so if you're using that product, you have to be careful. And there's not any kind of rainfall situation that's going to help this. Um, if you go down here and you add um, cinch with uh, atrazine included, it's the following year. Okay, so you can see that the restriction for wheat is much lower for the restrictions for, for rapeseed for most of those products. And that's one of the careful what we use in corn, what rate we use. Um, for example, on, for the atrazine, um, it varies with the rate. Rapeseed, it says nine months. You can find at least some information in the literature where there's a rate step. If you use a lower rate, you can come in a little bit. You can usually come in at the six-month mark, you know, for uh, especially with the rainfall that we tend to get in this part of the region. 
be dry, extend all of these. Okay, so if we get normal rainfall or above normal rain in the number of months, you have to wait. <coughs> So variety selection, I hope no one came today hoping to leave with um, a few varieties written down that they can recommend to their growers, why not? Besides the National Breeding Program, why would we not recommend a particular variety in this crop? How many of you um, have growers who have grown rapeseed before? Why did they grow it? They got talked into it by who? Not you, by a contractor. Does the contractor let the grower make the choice? Not for this crop, right? You can contract your wheat ahead of time. You still get to pick the variety for the most part, right? You, you pick the variety you want, soybean, you pick the variety you want for the most part. In this particular crop, a grower isn't going to grow it if he doesn't have a contract and he doesn't have a delivery point, and probably the seed's going to be provided by that contractor, and he might have a choice between two or three varieties. Um, so industrial rapeseed side. For the canola side, it's also going to be provided by the contractor, but there is a lot of open information about variety selection. Annual data for the National Winter Canola Variety Testing Program can be found at this website. All over yourself writing it down. If you Google search Kansas State and canola, you'll find it. They typically have um, tests for this all over the United States. For example, I have two in North Carolina. There's one in South Carolina, there's usually one in Georgia and two in Tennessee, and the same thing is true for the northern states as well. They try to test all over the U.S. wherever there's a person interested enough um, and with space to plant it. Um, so you can find pretty local information on how canola varieties perform if you're looking for that market. Most of the time in a given state, you're either growing industrial rapeseed because that's, or you're growing canola and not both. Um, they're the same species purposes for each one, um, but most of the time a contractor doesn't want one growing right now, and they will have restrictions about that in their, in their contract. Yes, there is a chemical difference in the oil profile. So one of them has um, the, the, we're not going to get into the, the biochemistry of it, but one of them can uh, fry things in and to feed to animals, and the other one is used for um, industrial lubricants and plastic coatings. Um, they also use industrial rapeseed, I think, in the peanut butter industry, but that's the only food use. So, um, but having them close together, as far as agronomically, there's no reason to keep them super far apart because they typically self. We have a few open, some of the contracts I've seen require five miles between, which is just totally um, un unreasonable. Land preparation, well-prepared seed. And we prefer to have a stale seed bed in this case, We're dealing with an, a tillage situation. Why would we want to deal with a stale seed bed? More moisture. Another really good reason for stale seed bed. Also important, but not the number one I'm looking for. Weed control. Very few herbicides labeled in this crop. So we definitely, if we have the opportunity to get that first flush and kill them, um, that would be really important. But all those other things you mentioned are important as well. No-till is possible, but it can be challenging, and that is the, for the reasons that you mentioned. We need good seed-to-soil contact. We're talking about a seed that is, even with the seed treatment included, less than a millimeter wide. Okay, so a very, very small, perfectly round seed. It flows around like water, so it's kind of hard to get it where you want it. Okay. Um, residue can be a challenge, because if it falls on that residue, it's still going to germinate if there's moisture present. But then you have an issue of where the crown gets set, and we'll talk more about that as we get. First, talk about burn down applications. Burn down before canola, these are the products that um, have been on recommendation sheets for a while, and here is the listed canola plant back restriction for them. Sharpen, while it has a four month restriction for the full rate, um, it does have a one ounce application supplemental label for burn down. Um, so it says one, one ounce and then one month per fluid ounce. So um, if you use this, they are expecting that you're going to wait 30 days after burn down to plant your crop, which is probably unlikely if I would have to venture a guess. 2,4-D and dicamba um, are very um, vague in their labels, and we're going to read part of the 2,4-D label here in a minute to look at that. But we have a lot of growers that put down a little bit of 2,4-D in with their glyphosate so that they can get better kill on some of their broadleaves um, and a little bit faster. 
How many of you have growers who are doing that, putting, still putting 2,4-D in with, with the rent? Okay. I don't want to waste too much time on this if nobody's doing it. So um, you all have pesticide licenses and you're here for, for credits and things like that for the whole school. So we're just going to take some time to read this herbicide label. Don't worry if you can't read it because I'm going to read it to you. So under labeled crops, this is the 2,4-D LV4 label. So under labeled crops, it says you can plant in the treated area within 29 days after an application of this product. That's pretty specific. Plant only those crops listed on this or other registered 2,4-D labels. Follow more specific limitations, if any, provided in directions for specific crops. So labeled crop, but if my crop's on the label, I need to go look at that, pe that part of the label. Of crop injury or loss if planted soon after application. Well, that's I can plant it within 29 especially during the four, first 14 days which described below should be considered in weighing this risk. And when are they planting after that? As soon as possible. Maybe right behind the spray rig, right? Maybe they're planting and the spray rig's behind them. Um, so this is kind of a, a more restricted route when you think about 2,4-D. For most crops, not an issue. If it's a, um, on the label, it's usually not a problem. But for canola, we do have issues with two, both 2,4-D and dicamba, so keep that in mind. Other crops, which is where we fall for canola, because we're not a labeled crop, we're in the other crop section, may be planted 30 or more days after application without concern for illegal residues. Well, I'm not really concerned about the illegal residue. I'm concerned about if you're going to kill my crop or not, right? However, under certain conditions, there may be a risk of injury to susceptible crops, degradation. Under normal conditions, any crop may be planted without risk of injury if at least 90 days of soil temperatures above freezing have elapsed since application. And 40 pages of the label read like this, just like any other herbicide label. Who is waiting 90 days to plant their crop after burn down? Nobody, and if you are, you probably have to go out there with some other burn down before you're doing that. So be very uh, wary, especially if you're using a full rate of 2,4-D in burn down. We can see, particularly with 2,4-D uh, injury to canola. So here's some data on that. Stand count, when the treatment was put out at planting, so this is coming in and four weeks after planting and plants are the non-treated, we had about 25 plants per meter squared, so that's what we're targeting. We have glyphosate, um, glyphosate plus sharpen, glyphosate plus 2,4-D plus a dicamba, and then glufosinate plus 240. And we can see the only burn down treatment that did not affect our stand count significantly was the glyphosate alone treatment. It was rolling on the same day as the sprayer. Now if we wait 10 days after putting the burn down on, we still see glyphosate did not significantly affect our stand count. All other combinations still significantly affected our stand count. At 20 days, still an issue. At 30 days, we finally start to see some of that come back up. But again, in our region, it's going to be highly unusual for a grower to wait that long unless he just has to because of weather um, situation. So my recommendation is if you um, are going out there, trying not to use 2,4-D or dicamba in that mixture, and if you can get away with glyphosate alone, um, go for it. If you have resistant weeds in your field where you need these other products, then you're probably going to have a challenge controlling those things in your canola crop or, or rapeseed crop anyway. Information. Um, it is a fairly expensive, um, so f I, I couldn't tell you per pound, um, but I have paid as much as $500 a bag, depending on the variety, if it's a, for canola. Um, industrial rapeseed is a little bit cheaper than that. Um, it's always going to have a seed treatment included. You're not, unless you're growing organic, you're not going to get away without a seed treatment. But it's also, um, if you think we're getting to seeding rates, it, we're talking about, um, for my recommendations, two to three pounds of seed per acre. So not like small grain where you're planting. You're going to get a substantial number of acres out of one bag compared to wheat where you need two bags an acre. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's an issue. Yes. You you really don't want to be losing stand. Um, and in your no-till situation, you want to be really conscious of your burn down because you're, usually you're going to go out with a more substantial burn down no-till situation, that burn down could be causing you stand loss and your seed to soil contact issue, residue issue could be causing you stand loss. So you want to be really careful. So 2,4-D, much more injurious overall than dicamba um, as far as canola goes um, or industrial rapeseed in all of the studies that I have done um, and I leave them out if possible in burn down applications. 
So that's just a summary of where we stuck the mark. We put the mark somewhere at the 45 day mark for safety on 240 following um, a burn down application. So that's too much for those burn down applications. Planting dates, you wanna plant four to six weeks before your first killing frost, okay? At least three weeks before your first killing frost, but preferably four to six. It's here because every one of us is in a different state. For me in North Carolina, it's October 10, September 10 to October 10. Um, for you all, it will be on what state you're in. Your best bet is if there is an RMA um, crop insurance program for canola or rapeseed in your state, use their guideline because if you don't plant in that window, you can't get insurance on it. If you have a contractor um, trying to get growers to grow it in your state, um, you know, refer to their information, but also compare that to um, Risk Management Association's um, information. No more than three quarter inches deep and preferably shallower than that if you have um, a good depth control. If you don't have good depth control, then just set your, set your rig shallow. Um, again, very small seed, it needs um, shallow planting so it can come up appropriately. Use an appropriate fungicide seed treatment. Usually you don't have to make this choice because the contractor has made it or the seed dealer has made it. And then again, unless you're growing an organic situation, you will not be able to purchase seed without a seed treatment on it. Um, we need six to eight well-developed leaves prior to a freeze effectively to survive the winter. So this is what I want my plants to look like as they go into the winter months. I want that crown set right at the soil level. I want six to eight nice looking leaves um, that are fully um, unfurled. And in this case, I'm usually growing on a 15 inch row spacing. I like, I recommend 15 or 22 inches depending on what kind of rig they have. You can grow it as seven inch rows. You can grow it as wide as 30s, um, but I like the, fit, the in between. And in this case, this plant will almost have leaves in between the rows on a 15 or a 22. There will still be a little bit of space in between as we go into the winter is kind of where I want it to be. And as soon as we get that freeze, we're going to start to melt down. How, you, you guys have seen this stuff in the winter? It looks awful, yeah? Then it's the first time your grower has ever grown it. It's going to have a freeze and he's going to call you up and he's like, why'd you tell me to grow this crap? It's dying. Right? They're not expecting a crap like that in the winter. You know, the heat looks fine all winter um, versus this winter crop where it really just for lack of a better term, it looks like hell all winter. It looks really awful. <laughs> this is not what you want it to look like in the winter. Now it will melt down some, but you will still have a green cast. These are dead canola plants, okay? Those are dead. So if you get a call for, to go out and evaluate, if they are straw colored 100% and there is no green growing point, these plants are dead. And you can tell them that in the winter. They so will have like kind of green and purple leaves. They'll all be kind of melted down out, but they'll still have some green to them. Early planting has the potential for too much crop growth and can lead to more issues with the freeze, okay? I have to walk that fine line, you know, do I want to be on the early side of that window so that I can make sure I make enough leaves, but I don't want it to be knee high and have 20 leaves on it because then I have all of this material above ground that is susceptible to those freezing temperatures, okay? That's greater susceptibility to winter kill and also a premature bolting in the fall season. Whenever I show the little cartoon graphic, um, but your wheat requires a vernalization period, right? Some varieties, it might be a short vernalization period requirement for a vernalization, okay? It goes through that, but if you get too many growing degree units in the fall, now it's not gonna bolt and, and send them up for the most part, they're gonna be down there at the ground at, um, at, at the ground level but if we have to go through the whole winter with that flower bud exposed then you have issues so you want to make sure and hit that mark of when is the best time to plant in your state so you don't get temperatures in the 70s and then all of a sudden it's going to be 28 tomorrow the plants don't like that and canola and rapeseed really don't like that um, so you get higher tendency um, to get winter kill or kill more plants that way than if you have and then we have the 50s and then okay we can have some 30 degree nights and it's okay. Seeding rates. We talked a little bit about this with your question. Um, you are going to see recommend um, the majority of extension information out there I have seen recommends at the five pounds of seed per acre mark. Your growers are planting their soybeans on a population. They're planting their corn on a population. Um, they should be able to understand that you need to plant all your crops on a population. My recommendation is 200,000 
to 250,000 plants um, per acre. It is, that's what you're looking for. for like the two to three pounds of, per acre mark, um, depending on the variety. And seed size, size just like in wheat and other um, small rain crops, can vary quite a bit, number of seed per pound. So make sure you're using that number to calculate rather than just saying, oh, plant three pounds per acre and you'll be fine. Adjust to the higher range if you're in a no-till situation. So that's why I'm going to range this. And as you have heavier residues on the no-till side, you be on the top end of that range. If I just have a grower who's got good um, depth control, I'm going to tell him 225,000 um, seeds is what right in the middle of that range if he's planting on time. Row spacing. We talked about there's a multi multiple row spacings. You can be in no-till. You can be in minimum till and strip till. You know, every situation. This is, um, 10, 20, and 30 inch spacings following um, dormancy. So these are just now coming out of dormancy. You can see the remnants of some of the kind of freeze, winter damaged leaves, but these are all coming out of dormancy. You're going to have uh, higher plants, and you can lose plants over the winter that way. So that's that 10 inch spacing. At the 7 inch or 7 and a half inch spacing, it might look even crazier. This will be full as, as soon as it starts to bolt, and you won't be able to see these empty spaces. The same thing is true for this 20 inch spacing. Would I love to have plants right here? Absolutely. Would I love to have plants right here? Absolutely. But this is going to create it's like a completely full field to harvest in the spring. Um, with a lot of seed pods developed, you'll get compensation for this. In that 30 inch row spacing, we see we don't have any missing plants in there. And the, all, the biggest issue is we don't have any row closure. Like this was open all winter. So in my part of the world, that's going to be full of chickweed and full of hen. Didn't get out there with my herbicide on time, um, and the same would be true. And then it has several weeks after green up before this will close. These are going to close rows pretty quickly after green up. A little longer for the 20 inch spacing. The 30 inch spacing we're looking like four weeks after green up. You have more. You can plant in the spring. You can expect a little bit lower yields because you don't have that um, vegetative growth um, that you the timing, but you will be able to accumulate enough heating units to plant in the spring and um, and make a crop. Just lower yields. Expect probably the 20 to 30 bushel range instead of 50 to 70. No-till system. So this is some testing that was done. Um, we have some guys out there with a monosem vacuum planter. This is going to give you um, excellent seed singulation. We have another company, um, Seed Hawk, with kind of a direct seeding shank openers, and we'll look at the difference between those two and know what to look for to see if their equipment is doing an appropriate job. So here's one uh, twin row uh, with the monosim vacuum planter. So this is no-till, um, but their disc opener is such that we're getting good seed to soil contact and cutting into that residue. And we have two nice green rows of canola right before, um, this is actually right before going into dormancy and it looks pretty good. Now looking at the Seed Hawk versus the John Deere 1890 single disc opener, and then this one has a double shank hoe opener. Um, these are also no-till situations, so this one's going to give potentially better seed to soil contact. Okay, the, these two stands, they were planted, same variety, planted on the same day, the two equipment. Judging by this picture, can you decide which one you would rather have? people say that's the same. The number of plants we developed are the same. The same. This is what they look like at freezing, essentially, after that first freeze. But overall, the stands look very similar. The plants look very similar. But if we dig a few of them up, we can see that they're very different. This one, which we had really good seed to soil contact and we were able to cut through that residue and make a nice opening, they're all straight. <coughs> This one with the single disc opener, where we maybe weren't able to cut through that residue real nicely and we had to leave some of it in place, almost every one of them is crooked, okay, because of the way that, that seed emerged and it's looking for the path of least resistance and it's just going to kink over a little bit. What's the issue with this? Do we care? Which one's better? We've well, right, you've also got more, like, see, we've got a lot, he's saying we got a lot more fibrous roots on this one than this one over here. Overall, the development fairly similar, but in May, when these things are full of seed, 
this part of the world, we can get strong storms. We can get hurricanes even um, start, the hurricane season starting. While you, you know, if you're going to get winds like that, anything's going to lay over. But we're going to have more issues with lodging and more issues with being able to pick up the crop if we have this versus this. What everything looks like on the surface is not. So no-till is a practice in our region. It's growing in our region. It's kind of um, planting strategies and equipment strategies that you can use to get a better stand. So here's another example. Um, these are the same variety planted on the same day um, in the same field. This plot got planted where with a single disc opener, no tillage whatsoever. You can see all the residue is still essentially in place. This had a light vertical tillage um, at like three, things like three degrees. Um, so very light tillage, but you can see a huge difference in sand development, a huge difference in, I mean, these pictures are on the same day. So the, these got a, he, a good, better start having that residue kind of incorporated and moved out of the way a little bit. Um, if you have growers who are willing to do vertical tillage, light vertical tillage in their no-till systems. Fertility recommendations. So uh, obviously very field to field, soil testing is important just like any other crop. Um, I recommend in my state, I wanna be at the 100 to 120 total units of N. Um, that also will depend on your yield potential. Sometimes we don't have um, yield history or yield goal information for a particular county. But if you're growing canola, you can at least get variety testing data from nearby so you know kind of what can be done um, with that variety because it can vary widely. In the same test, you're going to have varieties that make 1,000 pounds of seed per acre, and you're going to have varieties that make 6,000 pounds of seed per acre in, on the canola side. On the industrial rapeseed side, we're more in the 1,000 to 3,000 pound. You're going to be pushing your limits to do 3,500 pounds. Um, so you would adjust your nitrogen units based on that. Um, most states have a recommendation for at least one brassica oil seed. It doesn't matter if it isn't canola, that's the one you should select um, because the requirements will be very similar for all of the winter brassicas. For me, um, you know, North Carolina doesn't do, we don't get a boron recommendation unless we ask for it. Um, most of our soils are not deficient in boron, but I find that even on soils where we haven't seen any deficiency, we do better if we have a boron application. Um, some of our companies are recommended up to a whole pound in a year. In the fall, once in the spring. I use a quarter pound and a quarter pound. So a quarter pound in fall and a quarter pound in spring. Um, I put the fall application out with my pre-plant and I put the spring application out with top dress. Um, and typically, I also put sulfur in the spring, um, but it should definitely be putting sulfur out um, at pre-plant as well. The mustards make a lot of compounds that we don't care about that have sulfur in them, but the plant cares about them. So they do better if they have enough sulfur available. So even if you're not in a sulfur deficient soil, this is a, a micro or a nutrient you should consider. Um, and sulfur is gonna be in my recommendation for production practice. How much sulfur, 40 pounds? You can get by with that. You, some, if you're sulfur deficient, you want to be higher than that. So if you're just um, 30 to 40 on soils that have enough, and then I usually put the sulfur out. If, if I can, I try to get that out there at planting. But you can put some out in the spring as well. The boron is always split. Other questions about these? The rest of it, you're just going to be looking for those to, um, for deficiencies to go through what those deficiencies look like. Um, you won't always have good um, state labs that can tell you, you know, tissue testing wise in this crop um, what the, the deficiencies are, but we have some good image sets out there that you can look at. So I'm going to go through uh, many of um, Brian Arnell's program. He's happy to share them. So later, if you guys want a poster of this or some image sets, so just shoot me an email or shoot Brian an email, and we're happy to share those um, for you and your growers. In fact, the poster is a decision, su decision support tool, so it's a yes, no key. What am I looking at and, and what's the deficiency? All of the ones I'm going to show you right now are oldest leaves, okay? So these, these symptoms for the next few nutrients are going to occur in the oldest leaves first. Phosphorus, I'm not looking for this one until springtime because in the winter, we can get purpling along the edges of the leaves 
just due to environmental factors, particularly freezing temperatures can also cause purpling in rapeseed and canola. So I'm not usually looking for this deficiency until it's green up in the spring. If I still see this purpling, then I'm going to think, okay, I need to get some phosphorus out there. Usually this one you're going to know could be an issue for you based on pH or deficiency. In North Carolina, we don't have a lot of phosphorus deficient soils, but pH can sometimes cause magnesium. So here we're starting to see kind of lower, um, lower leaf intervenal chlorosis. And we also get kind of a, um, a wrinkled appearance and all of the, um, and you can notice them. Usually the canola leaf looks very smooth. There's all over the surface of the leaf. And in a mag magnesium deficiency, that's going to show up more pronounced because it's wrinkling all of that leaf tissue. Boron deficiency, so this one be ready to look for uh, because it needs uh, quite a bit of boron. So this one just looks like it doesn't really ever have any discoloration. It just nitrogen deficiency, just like any other crop, you're going to have that bright yellow. You know, it's going to turn off first, but then you're going to get bright yellowing and senescence or death of those oldest leaves. They're going to put that nitrogen up first, and they're going to try and put nitrogen in their young leaves. Um, and that'll be your, and always a bright yellow for canola or industrial rapeseed. Potassium, that same coloration, but only on the outer edge. And then you'll start to see those crisp up on the outer edge um, before the whole entire leaf turns yellow. So that would be a good difference between the nitrogen and the potassium, even though the color is the same. You're going to get crisping on these leaves, whereas of the nitrogen, it's not going to start to die full until the whole leaf is yellow. Calcium deficiency looks like you scorched it. We're still in the oldest leaves. Getting ready to cover are going to be youngest leaves. So for sulfur, we're going to get that bright pink around the outside edge. And then the internal, intervenal part is usually not yellow. It's usually more white for canola and rapeseed. And other crops, like we to tell that sulfur deficiency from a nitrogen deficiency in some cases. In canola and rapeseed, it's a little easier because we get whitening or more bleaching look than we get yellowing. Iron deficiency all the way um, intervenal chlorosis, like all your other crops that you deal with. Copper, more of a bronze look. Manganese, this one is also intervenal chlorosis, so you might have some trouble distinguishing it. Um, if we go back and look at iron, okay, so there's the iron, and there's your manganese. So if you're, you know, a field, it might be hard to see those subtle differences. To me, Manganese when I walk out into the field and my um, a viral disease, right? So those viral diseases that affect the vegetables that kind of give you that appearance, kind of mixed together, those are the ones where I would think manganese versus when we go to the iron, it's basically the same color all over. Just so if you have that kind of subtlety that you can put in your mind, I always just, this one to me just looks like some sort of viral disease rather than, I don't think, nutrient first. And we have a ton of diseases in, in the mustards, so we don't have to worry about those. Molybdenum, just general terrible appearance, more of a kind of muddy color instead of being green, and it usually is, will crisp up pretty quickly. And then zinc. Okay. So again, you can see that this is a whole plant picture, so you can see the oldest leaves look fine, and now we're starting to see um, your between the zinc and the nitrogen, the nitrogen yellowing is going to be in the oldest leaves instead. Questions about nitrogen nutrient deficiencies? Again, just shoot me an email um, if you want additional posters or whatever. Pest management. I'm not going to go like super deep into this because for the pathogens and for the um, insect pests, pretty much the things that you have labeled in other crops, we have labels for the oilseed crops as well. So things that are going to kill um, aphids and caterpillars in your other summer crops, winter crops are going to kill aphids and caterpillars in this crop, and there are not really um, big restrictions on that. Um, we have cabbage moth, fall armyworm, cabbage seed pod weevil, and aphids as our main um, issues in insect land and then in our fungus land the sclerotinia is our biggest issue we can have some like 
Aster yellows, that will be kind of an aphid transmitted disease that you see once in a while, but usually don't get it in a whole field situation. Um, sometimes you'll have some black pods um, if it's been really wet during seed set. Um, and also that's a situation, that's just a, a field situation as well as you know, the whole region versus a sclerotinia, which can be moved around a little more readily um, in seed sources and things like that. Here is your kind of scouting um, information. This is developed in Oklahoma, but our, our season is exactly the same here as it is there. Um, they deal with a little more, wor few more worms than we do, um, but if we get any of these kind of things around here, you're gonna have them. Um, our aphids are gonna be a different, um, except for cabbage aphid, our aphids are generally gonna be a different suite of aphids, but the timeline for looking for them is the same. And then you're gonna see the cabbage moth more in and then that little cabbage seed pod we fold also in the spring after the pods have formed. Weed control, this will be the last thing that we cover. Here are your labeled products. Sonalin and Treflin for pre. Stinger is your only post over the top application allowed for broad leaves. You have two ACCase inhibitors, Assure2 and Post, which are gonna be for your grass weed control as long as you don't have ACCase resistant grasses. Glyphosate is in there because it has a label, obviously only on traded crop. Industrial rapeseed does not have any glyphosate traded varieties. Canola has lots of glyphosate traded varieties. So if you need to control the weeds you have, then you need to be going with canola versus industrial rapeseed. We do have other products that are safe that have been demonstrated um, as safe, but that are not labeled. Um, we're working on that, obviously, through IR4 and other outlets for getting specialty crop labels. So the final thing we're gonna end up with is um, weed management. So we're gonna have a little primer here to see where you, are, you guys are. What is this one? Henbit. What are we gonna use to control this one? And if you're gonna try and control this with Stinger, it better be this one, not this one. Because this is the only one that Stinger's gonna control. Treflan is also a decent choice if you know you have um, henbit in your seed bank, which most people do if they're dealing with winter crops. And then obviously you can also take care of this one in your burn down. A lot of times henbit is gonna be up at, at the time when you would be burning down um, before planting. What about this one? Chickweed. Chickweed, okay. All the same things apply to this one. Control it when it's small with stinger. Control it with your two pre-emergent herbicides, um, one or the other, or you have post, um, post over the top stinger or burn down. This guy? Mayor's tail, we don't have a good opportunity for controlling this if we're not taking care of it burned down. Because as soon as it gets any size on it, again, Stinger is not gonna take care of it, it has a lot of hairs on it, so Stinger's just not a good product against this um, little bugger. And then uh, Italian ryegrass, we can control if it is not ACCase resistant. So if we have ALS resistance or there's group two resistance, we can control it in rapeseed or canola. If we have ACCase resistance, no go, because the only two products we have are graminicides. They're the Assure and the Post. They're both ACCase, so if you know you have ACCase resistance, you're better off to go with wheat so that you can put Axial out. I think that's where I stopped last time. So if we have uh, um, questions, I also have information here about marketing and storage. If you have interest later, um, you can shoot me an email and I can send it out to you. Um, otherwise, just questions about what I've covered here this morning. What is the general price per pound or whatever they sell it for? For um, a grower to get? Um, they, they've been hovering around 15 cents per pound. 15 cents per yep. pound. Other questions? There's definitely opportunity for expansion in the crop. In this region, it's going to be more challenging. You know, I was, when I was in Oklahoma, there, was huge, there were huge increases while I was there. When I got there, we had 100,000 acres. The very next year, we had 450,000 acres, and they're projected to be um, close to a million once they kind of top out. Um, so we have um, about a million and a half acres open in a given year if we're on a three-year rotation with wheat here. Um, we just, the problem we have in the Mid-Atlantic is the way the crop is contracted and delivery points. Out there, there are delivery points. They're all for canola. The growers are all growing, or 90% growing Roundup Ready canola. So they have that system and they understand it. Here, we have so many specialty markets that want organic, or they, this state wants industrial, and the neighboring states wants canola, 
And that makes it really hard when you're trying to put together a supply chain. So I see it slowly improving if the companies don't get together and understand that they can plant these crops on farms side by side, then it's gonna be slow, slow go. I get, I get, as an agronomist, I'm frustrated every time I see one of those companies come up on my phone. Because <laughs> they all want me to recommend their crop versus the other crop, and I'm like, they're the same thing. <laughs> in, in the Dakotas and in Canada, they plant spring. It's a spring. It's a spring canola. Completely different set of varieties. So you can grow the winter types. You can plant them in the spring. Um, but it's a completely different, they're bred for different timings of planting. So you can get, if you're with a spring um, canola, you're going to be able to see the same top yields if you're planting a spring type. But we don't really have a lot of access to spring type seeds here. All right. Well, I hope you guys have safe travels home.